Hello, madam. Please join. <laughs> A very warm good, good evening to one and all. It's a wonderful day and I, Ganga P of fifth semester B farm, feel very privileged to extend my warm welcome to all presented here. Today, we have gathered here as a part of World Pharmacist Day celebration to a webinar on nanomedicine to address bone metastasis in association with Manipur Central University Imphal, coordinated by Department of Pharmacology the Daily College of Pharmacy and Research Center. Let's start the function by a prayer song by College Choir. They shall be showers of blessings. This is the promise of love. They shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. 
My sea drops round us are falling, but for the showers we bleed. But for the showers we bleed. But for the showers we bleed. Thank you, friends. Now, I request all the participants to remain silent for one minute in remembrance of Sri Krishna Sir, founder and chairman, and Sri Madhi Shanda Das Ma'am, secretary, the Delhi Group of Institutions. Let us take a moment to pause and honor. Now, to begin with, I would like to invite the Honorable Principal of the Daleview College of Pharmacy and Research Center, Dr. Shijikumar Sir, to deliver the welcome speech. Good evening to all and all. Is it audible? Yes, sir. Audible. Okay, thank you. So, the most respected chairman, our uh, president of today's function, Dr. Dina Das, ma'am, I am welcoming, ma'am, to this function. Then, uh, today uh, we have uh, Professor Dr. Vardra Ansar, uh, who is a uh, great scientist as well as a great academician. He is uh, rendering his helping his support hand to the Delhi group of uh, institutions in all aspects. I welcome you, sir, to this function. Now, today's topic is uh, nanomedicine. For, the, for, for addressing uh, bone metastasis. So, uh, all we know that several uh, scientific fields get benefited by the introduction of this nanotechnology or nano, nanotechnology. So, particularly in this pharmaceutical sector, after introduction of this uh, nano medicine, most of the demerits or uh, uh, shortfalls of conventional dosage forms can be overcome by this introduction of nano medicine. So this have a high efficacy as well as targeting of a particular drug can be possible by means of a nanomedicine. Today we have a wonderful uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Shivumar Vijayada Gavilusar. He's Associate Professor of Life Science Department of uh, Manipur Central University. So on behalf of uh, the Delhi College of Pharmacy and Research Center, I extend my sincere welcome to this, sir. sir welcome to this function. Uh, he's going to give a wonderful seminar on the topic of nanomedicine to address uh, bone metastasis. So thank you one and all. I am handing over this section to our presidential function, presidential for this seminar, Dr. Dina Das, ma'am. Ma'am, please join this function. Um, Dina, Dina Das ma'am had uh, not yet joined this meeting, um, so I'm going to... So, we can go directly for the inauguration? Uh, uh, no, no, sir, Dina Das ma'am uh, joined now. Joined? Okay, okay. Uh, sir, uh, yes, sir, yes. Uh, so, uh, next, I welcome Dr. Dina Das ma'am, Chairman, the Daleview College of Pharmacy and Research Center, for delivering the presidential address. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Thank good evening, sir. Good evening. Sorry for being late. Uh, I have some connection issues. I think uh, there was some problem in joining the uh, conference. So, and uh, uh, so everyone, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a very uh, pleasure moment for all of us because being part of uh, a pharmacist group, uh, joining here uh, to uh, to attend this uh, topic on nanomedicines. I think uh, that's one of the novel uh, drug delivery system areas. And I'm sure that this conference is going to really help all of our students to understand more on targeted uh, medications and how, as a pharmacist, they can work on these areas. And uh, 
also vardhan sir and we are really thankful for you, to you because you are our real mentor and constant supporter always you make sure that uh, we are up to date in what is happening around the world by arranging a lot of webinars for our students and uh, uh, so we actually look very much forward for this uh, conference because uh, we are expecting uh, actually we were planning to have an offline meeting offline web uh, seminars but uh, due to the restrictions of time and uh, of course the facilities we have to go online but uh, the support that you are giving us is tremendous and uh, thank you so much sir for your support and i request all our participants to give a uh, 100 percentage uh, support attend the webinar very carefully understand what sir is delivering today and uh, today's chief uh, i mean the guest also is also a very experienced person and uh, i think uh, all of you should uh, have a great understanding make use of this resourceful people like this uh, to learn more and also to uh, deliver that to the future generations so i also uh, thank uh, dr shiva kumar vijay rakhavan sir also uh, for being part of us today and uh, uh, for the address thank you so much thank you ma'am a good teacher and monitor can inspire whom ignite imagination and instill love of learning i feel extremely honored to have dr r varadarajan sir professor and dean school of life sciences central university manipur dr r varadarajan professor and dean school of life science central university manipur achieved his doctorate degree in zoology from university of madurai kamraj delhi and madras respectively His area of specialization is insect systematics, ecology, and management, and has an academic experience of 41 years in research field and 34 years in PG teaching. He has supervised several research projects and published four monographs, and also made a short film on insect migration for UGC countrywide classroom. He was honored with DBT National Associate Award by DBT New Delhi and Lifetime Achievement Award. by society of tropical agriculture in new delhi and his achievements goes on now i welcome sir to do the inaugural address thank you for the nice introduction i am indeed very happy to join you and give this inaugural address and delhi view college is you know very near to me in my mind not because of any other reason that we have signed an mou with uh, bellevue college of pharmacy and almost every month or at least alternate month we are having some or other program and that enrich our knowledge as well as the students knowledge in the pharmacology institute at the outset i would like to thank the chairman deena das the managing director dr david delphi the principal shiji kumar other faculty members of the pharmacology college and my dear students and other faculty members of the different departments of delhi college it gives me great pleasure in this inaugural function almost every day if you look at out of these 365 days every day becomes important for us either we celebrate mothers day daughters day fathers day patriots day labors day like that doctors day diabetics day like that so every day becomes very important it is marking an occasion so when we celebrate a different days why we wanted to show the significance of that day and today it happens that it is a world pharmacist day and really uh, i appreciate that you know it is they have chosen the day here as a pharmacist day because they are part and parcel of the medical wing they are no doubt paramedicals but they have equal commitment and involvement in the health of human being and particularly during the last 3 4 years during the period of covid infection 
I could see that you know the pharmaceutical shops were open and they were offering medicines. See, just imagine if the shop man, the pharmacist may not be knowing whether the customer is a, a COVID positive or negative. But irrespective of that, he was uh, attending the prescription and uh, reading the prescription and giving the medicine, thereby trying to get some kind of a relief and cure to the patient. It is very, very important. So, for example, we people, normal people, we don't have the courage, to, courage of touching the paper because touching anything at the time, COVID time, you know, we were having a second thought whether to do it or not. Otherwise, you say, you tell or you contact me through phone. So like that, we were trying to avoid. But the pharmacist, they did everything. Majority of the uh, I mean, minor diseases, majority of the, uh, are the initial stages of the COVID, they were trying to help by giving paracetamol and other related tablets. So therefore, their contribution is immense and they need appreciation. And not only that, sometimes, you know, consulting doctor becomes very, very difficult. Because some section of the people, like a below poverty level, going to the doctor, they go oh, how to pay consulting fee and get the medicine. But here in our country, we have a liberal system of giving the medicine by the pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical companies because they know that with normal paracetamol or sidedown or any kind of a headache or any minor ail body ailments can be treated by mostly by the pharmaceutical shops by giving one or two doses of medicines. At least some emergency basis, they give the medicine and try to give a relief for the people. So therefore, uh, we, they need, they need, they deserve sincere appreciation from the public. So in order to appreciate their commitment, in order to appreciate their role in the society, human society, especially for the welfare of the human life, today is chosen as a world pharmacist day. And uh, on this occasion, we have a special speaker who has been well trained in the field of um, pharmacology. Dr. Shiva Kumar he is going to uh, address the pharmacology students. We felt that it will be more relevant because a number of pharmacology students are there to hear this talk and they will be benefited by this talk. And therefore, I have a what I call, I'm really happy and uh, it gives me great privilege of uh, uh, inaugurating this function. I am sure that. Uh, this pharmacist day observance will give lot of input and a lot of uh, what I call uh, opportunity to the youngsters, especially to the pharmacology students and uh, other uh, people around uh, in in not only celebrating it but also getting a lot of uh, benefits from that. I, I am very happy that Delhi College immediately accepted our request and then we had a, a good understanding and therefore the college authorities both chairman principal as well as the managing director readily gave the date and then this function has been inaugurated i am very happy about it thank you very much for giving this opportunity i am sure that you are going to have a wonderful time on the topic concept thank you very much thank you so much sir for your valuable words now I welcome Dr. Shivakumar Vijay Raghavelu, sir, Associate Professor, Department of Life Sciences, Manipur Central University. Dr. Shivakumar Vijay Raghavelu, sir, secured his doctorate from the University of Madras on interdisciplinary subjects. He is now currently working as an Associate Professor in Department of Life Sciences, Manipur University. He also holds post postdoc fellowship in cancer nanomedicine from Cleveland Clinic Foundation, Ohio, USA. For more than a decade, he worked in the field of nanomedicine in World Ranking 2, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, USA. This foundation honored him by including his achievements in its newsletter, and he is an innovator awardee from Cleveland Foundation. He has publications in high impact journals with impact factor about 10 and also listed in Marcus Who's Who in America for four consecutive years. 
He has 40 international papers published and three patents published and 10 copyrights and also convened more than 30 webinars. Now, I welcome Sir for a talk on nanomedicine to address bone metastasis. Please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a very nice introduction. And uh, can I share my slides? Yes, sir. Thank you. Is my slides visible? No, sir. It's not visible. Okay, once again. No? Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Okay. Yeah. So can I start formally? Yes, sir. You can please sir. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very nice introduction. Uh, I don't know the first student person name so maybe ganga thank you very much for you thank you sir welcome yeah. sir uh, and i sincerely thank um, uh, dr dina das the chairman who uh, nicely told about me and also i thank uh, dr david alfi managing director and uh, dr uh, shiji kumar ps uh, the principal who little bit briefed about the uh, nano formulations nano medicine and I sincerely thank uh, our Dean, uh, Professor R. Vardarajan sir, who had given me this opportunity. And I love to uh, talk about, uh, talk on this day of uh, World Pharmacist today, because um, I also took classes for pharmacists for almost three years uh, when I was working in Saudi Arabia and King Khalid University College of Pharmacy. So it goes to close to my heart where those students gave me three face-to-face -face awards and one online award for a teacher. So with this uh, brief intro, uh, we would like to see as uh, Professor R. Vardarajan sir told, you know, uh, during the COVID-19, the pharmacist played an uh, immense role. If you take the entire circle, healthcare as a circle, it's like the circle cannot be completed without pharmacist. See, the doctors, uh, the doctors prescribe the drugs to educate the doctors. Many of the pharmacists who go as the uh, salesperson. They go to them, they tell them about the new updates, new generation of drugs. Because these doctors are very busy, they don't have much of time in India to uh, go through the literature. But uh, doctors in Western countries, they go through. So the pharmacies, there they play a role. Then the prescription giving, there they play a role. And there are nowadays, like PharmD students, they are also playing a role in clinical pharmacy. They are doing their research, doing their work in clinical research. So uh, they deserve the world pharmacist today. A pharmacy in the modern terms, modern um, uh, modern era is like highly structured education. But if any pharmacist is an intrinsic nature of a human being, when somebody is under ailment, say for example, when you fall down, you fell down, even a small kid when it's fell down, and it will try to address its issue you know, uh, the, you try to apply some oil or something. It's an intrinsic nature of a human being to be a pharmacist. Say, for example, somebody is living in a forest. So not necessarily only the tablets we give becomes a pharmaceutical compound. They may, they may take some leaf decoctions. They may make some leaves and then they become the pharmacist. So it's an age-old uh, phenomenon. As far as the... Hello, sir. Hello, sir. You are not audible now.
many people will tell you know pharmacy got saturated there is no job you know like uh, it is very difficult to get but there are plenty of jobs for the pharmacist you have to open up your eyes in different sectors and then there is job opportunity is there so uh, let me come to my uh, topic of this day nano medicine to address the bone metastasis you can see here this is the uh, uh, radiography of the bone bone metastasis you can see the tumor is all over the body when the tumor is all over the body you can see how much pain it will be with skeletal related events will be very high so to overcome this how the nano medicine plays a role i will be presenting my own research data which has been published in high impact like the biomaterials which is having an impact factor of around 15.3 so uh, here um, by nano medicine because nano most of the compounds dr shiju kumar told most of the drugs you know like which are cannot be used or because of the high toxicity or to you want to increase their uh, bioavailability or decrease their side effects so we can now um, very well use of this nano technology or the nano medicine convert them in the form of a nano medicine and then it can be sold so the, there are a lot of research are undergoing so there will be a potential increase in the, we call it as a precision medicine or like you know um, targeted delivery or many many terminologies are given to this by 2021 uh, it was 221 billion dollars is the world market it is estimated to increase by 361.44 billion dollars what does that mean it means that a lot of products are in the pipeline fda is going to approve and then the lot many lot many drugs will be converted into the nano formulations okay since a lot of students are there like i thought of uh, going little bit basic so what do you mean by nano medicine i'm telling the title is on nano medicine then i'm telling nano medicine is uh, of a global market uh, it's uh, it has a lot of high potential for research and as well as uh, products coming out line so what does that the terminology nano medicine means so it is nothing but application of nano technology to prepare the medicines to address the human ailments it this can be like you know uh, synthetic drugs natural drugs uh, drugs from natural agents or it can be proteins it can be nucleic acids such as rna dna uh, you know many micro rna such rna whatever type of rna is there basically all comes under the nucleic acids anything you can convert either encapsulate them or conjugate them with a polymer or with there are different type of materials are there with any kind of material and make them in the form of a nano size then this will be called as nano medicine so what do you mean by nano size <coughs> mathematically it is called as 10 power minus 9 nanometers so here given the uh, nanometer range water molecule is in the 10 power minus 1 of the nanometer glucose is 1 nanometer so the particles which we are support uh, supposed to be of high therapeutic value should be from 10 to 100 nanometer by definition uh, so excuse me sir uh, sorry yeah. for interrupting uh, yes. sir actually we can't see the slide now screen is oh. not shared now it's not shared uh, not uh, no sir i think so there is some network issues okay Okay, so okay, please stop me if some technical issues happen like this. Okay. Um. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Okay. Now it's visible. All right. So one second. Let me make it as picture. Okay, so you you interrupt me if there is nothing. Um, I mean, if something goes wrong. So this slide you all seen? Uh, no, sir. Oh, this was I am telling about the Indian pharmaceutical market. So this slide you would have seen, am I right? Yes, sir. This this is uh, this is something basic which I was telling. Were you able to hear me at that time? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Actually, there was a small interruption, but still, we were able to hear you. Okay, it is the 
Uh, it is the same thing which I told you. I was telling that the world pharmacy, pharmaceutical market budget, this one, and Indian pharmaceutical, uh, you know, uh, estimated uh, amount in billions, like in by 2030, it will reach the 130 billions. It will be from 2021 to 2030, it is three times more uh, increase will be there. Um, there. I was telling about my topic, nanomedicine to address the bone metastasis. This is about the global nanomedicine market, which I was telling. And uh, I would like to stick to time. Uh, 6.55 is your time, I'm right. So we can go a little faster. So what I was telling what is nanomedicine. So I was defining in an elaborate manner. Nanomedicine is application of nanotechnology principles to prepare the medical uh, medicines that could address the human ailments. They are of uh, small size, 10 power minus 9 in nanometer. Uh, so this was I was telling like, you know, the water is 10 power minus 1 of nanometers and the glucose is one nanometer the particles which we are making these are different type of particles mentioned at this side so they are um, these are various type of particles they can fall between 10 to 100 nanometer in size they are like little lesser than the virus and smaller than the bacteria and uh, several times smaller than the sand grain if you take one sand grain the nanoparticle the sand grain will be like at least uh, 10,000 times bigger than the uh, nanoparticle so to better understand what is the size of the nanoparticle, if you take an, a red blood cell like this, you know, if you uh, see it's a diameter on this side, so the diameter is 7,000 nanometers wide. On an average, uh, any nanoparticle should be around 100 nanometer or less than 100 nanometer in their electron microscopically. So in when you take such kind of a particle like you know 7,000 and 100, with 700 times it is smaller. That is RBC is 700 times bigger nanoparticle which we are using for as a medicine will be smaller 700 times. If you imagine one human being is 5 feet and imagine 700 human beings stand one above the other, one above the other, one above the other. Okay, uh, Like that if it will be like a mountain height versus one a small human being. This is the size of the particle. So there are various other examples has been given. If you take the human uh, hair, you know, it is like human hair is much, much bigger compared to the particles which we are talking about. A4 paper, which you are using on the sides, it is, you know, 75,000 nanometer thick. You cut it by 100, you know, then you know 750 times this is bigger, you know, uh, the size. So same way, uh, this uh, data is adapted from Australian Academy of Science. Knowingly or unknowingly, we are also making nanoparticles in our day-to-day -day life. Micelles, uh, formulations, everything. For example, turmeric. Why we are boiling and drinking turmeric in milk, you know? The turmeric, the curcumin is highly hydrophobic. So which will not dissolve in the water. When you put it in water, it cannot dissolve. So what you are doing, so you are adding the curcumin in the milk so that the hydrophobic parts of the curcumin is dissolved in the milk and the milk also contains the fat globules so they when you you know boil it and then mix it it forms the micelles so these micelles we are also adding pepper to it this is very common in south india you add the pepper to it why because piperidine increases the turmeric curcumin bioavailability by nine times which otherwise it's very very poorly absorbed by the body so that goes as a treatment. So this is also a form of a medicine, just uh, for you to understand. Okay. So the particles which we make, um, so how long they will circulate? So let's go to this one. Why we have to make the nanoparticles? Why we have to take efforts to make them into the nanoformulation? For one, increased efficacy. We have to increase the efficacy because when we give the drugs in solution as such, they, are, they can reach the therapeutic window and, the, and they can go the, uh, you know, they supersaturate the dose in the plasma peak can reach very faster and they can fall down like this green line shown here. Various drugs in the nanoparticles are tend to be released. We can control, control the release profile based on whatever our requirement of the disease. So thereby you can maintain the suboptimal dose in the plasma for a longer time and we can avoid the systemic toxicity thereby we can target the drug to a specific region thereby you can avoid the systemic toxicity so this is the major advantage of the nano formulations and number of since we are targeting to a specific location 
the drug amount required will be will also be less so it is more economical than the free drug uh, therapy so once we make the nano formulations or nanoparticles um, so what we can do is we can test the advantage of nanoparticles is like it can be theranostic theranostic means it can be both uh, diagnostic it can be used as a diagnostic agent and as well as it can carry the therapeutic molecule so in this case um, i am using an ir dye this is actual experiment performed by myself i used an ir dye and i also used an anti cancer drug and made a nanoparticle so now we injected via the tail vein parenteral route of administration has been given so you know this is the tumor uh, location here and you can see uh, before injection animals no signal is there as soon as it has been injected we can see some signal here five minutes then one hour it is more localized into the liver it went to the liver and then it's going to the tumor here you can see they are in the tumor after one day like even here also you can see in one hour they are in the tumor region and then in 72 hours then 240 hours then we had did up to 20 days actually 240 hours is 10 days we did up to 20 days their particles are in circulation particles are in circulation and they are releasing the dye and as well as the drug so this means what we created a particle which can localize into the tumor and it can slowly um, act upon the therapy the tumor and it acts act can act as a therapeutic agent i mean audible to everyone Yes, sir, you're on. Okay. So uh, let's see. Um, so how it goes into the tumor, I will tell later after this slide. Uh, so they, there is uh, something called as active targeting and as well as passive targeting. Uh, if you uh, encapsulate them, if you coat them with, um, you know, uh, any receptor or ligands, um, ligands which can bind to the receptor, then, they, then it becomes an active targeting. If you don't do anything just because the tumor will have a leaky vasculature, it can easily go into the uh, tumor region and thereby it can bind to the cells and it can uh, release the drug of choice. So that is the passive targeting. For in case of cancer, passive targeting is more than sufficient. The data I can show you. Okay. So here I am taking example uh, of the cancers which go into the bone. One is the prostate and another one is the breast cancer. So these are the two prominent or the dominant cancers in the world. In case of USA, this is 2022 data, you can see 2,68,490 cases, new cases are uh, occurring and out of that 34,500 people are dying, approximately 13% death is there. In case of breast cancer, near to 3 lakh people are there, new cases and death is around uh, 43,000 which is like 15%. About uh, 60, 65 to 70 percentage of breast and prostate cancers, they go to the bone. They metastasize to the bone. Why? Because bone is the rich niche. Because most of our blood cells are formed in the bone. So for anything to grow faster and better, you need nutrients. So the nutrients are more available in the bone. So the cancers tend to go to the bone so that they can survive better. So people with the bone metastasis, their five-year survival rate is only 3%. Various people without the bone metastasis, 56 percentage of them they can survive. Whether they survive with or without uh, for longer time or not, but the pain will be very high. Significant pain due to skeletal related events. If you consider, uh, this is about the US data. What about the Indian data? In Indian data, it is 34,540 cases, new cases, as of Globacon 2020. But uh, it's, even though it is the data is very, uh, incidence is very less in Indian male, but if you see the death rate, death rate is 50% of the incidence. Here in Western countries, the death rate is 13 to 15% only, but in India, it is like 50% of the population is dying and due to changing in lifestyle, food habits and other things, they estimated the prostate cancer is skyrocketing, both prostate and as well as breast cancer is skyrocketing in India too. So it is the right time for us to design therapies and test the therapies in the preclinical models. Then we can go for the clinical models by next 20 to 30 years, those kind of drugs can be uh, launched into the market. So um, how we can do, why the, why the tumors go to the bone? Because the bone receives in case of challenges, what are the challenges? Bone receives only 5% of the cardiac output. So say for example, if you are giving 100 milligram of drug, you know, there in the blood, 
and then five five percent that is five uh, out of five liters only five percent going to the bone imagine the amount of drug going there is also cut down you know and it is highly perfused than soft tissue organs thus attaining therapeutic doses to suppress the tumor growth is of concern because of this what happens they have to overdose the patient when you overdose a patient with the uh, anti cancer drugs what happens it can lead to cardiac toxicity for example doxorubicin if you overdose it the, per the person is going to die because of heart attack not because of the tumor so there should be a balance okay so various nano formulations has been attempted uh, those who favor the uh, bisphosphonate and everything but uh, due to like you know uh, not selecting the proper polymers and materials they had some uh, default and they are not able to successful so hence in our lab uh, this work was done in america when i was there in the us so in our lab we took this as a challenge to address this issue and then we designed the uh, formulation so before i talk about the formulation let's uh, understand the pharmacology like how um how uh, what is the mechanism how this uh, prostate cancer favors the homes the bone and what it obtains from it so this is the mechanism uh, when the prostate cancer cell enters the bone it induces the osteoblast uh, osteoblast by releasing the osteoblastic factors osteoblast blast means something you know uh, dividing or multiplying at a faster rate so osteo means bones so these cancer cells will induce the osteoblast to divide uh, to uh, form the uh, bone you know so once this osteoblast are formed the bone is already there they want to remodel reform the bone remodel the bone they will induce the osteoclast they are the clastogenic agents they will dissolve the bone these are macrophages they will be there available in this environment once the osteoblast gives a signal they will convert into osteoclast and they will start chewing it when they start chewing the bones they will uh, dismantling the bone they will release all the uh, factors like growth factors minerals and whatever required for the growth will be released the prostate cancer cell or the breast cancer cell which is in this environment will be happy to eat those growth factors and they will multiply they will eat multiply then they will ask the osteoblast to release the rank ligand this is called a rank ligand this will go and bind to the rank receptor in the osteoclast they will again eat the bone so the bone will be getting dissolved and this person will be keep growing and this becomes like a cycle so three people are involved one is prostate cancer guy another one is an osteoblast and another one is an osteoclast he tells the osteoblast to release the rank ligand he releases the rank ligand so the, he dissolves the bone so if you want to cut this uh, triangle you know uh, this is kind of a love triangle between these three if you want to cut this uh, triangle so what you have to do one the primary uh, guy the prostate cancer has to be killed that can be given with the um, anti cancer drug that can be done with an anti cancer drug and this drug should reach the bone so to reach the bone what we are doing we are putting them in the nano formulation so that it can reach the bone there it can release the drug and it can kill this is one aspect but understand not all the cancer cells will die immediately because he is rich in growth factors he is keep on dividing the amount of drug we give may be less so we have to do a dual therapy second thing is the major reason the bone is getting dissolved is osteoblast talking to osteoclast without knowing the influence of an outsider this home people are fighting our home people are damaging their home so this osteoblast should not talk to osteoclast for that what we have to do we have to stop this ligand moving from here and binding to the receptor how we can do that we can make a uh, antibody monoclonal antibody against this ligand which can competitively go and bind to the receptor if the antibody binds to the receptor this ligand cannot come and bind to the receptor it's like lock and key already i put some key and i put fevicol and stick on the keyhole the next person cannot come and put the key and open the door it's like that so the ligand rank ligand cannot go and bind to the osteoclast since no signal is coming from uh, osteoblast this osteoclast will stop digesting the bone thereby you can stop the bone growth so dual therapy one 
we are killing the cancer cells using the anti cancer drug two we are uh, inhibiting the interaction between osteoblast and osteoclast using an antibody anti rankle antibody which is commercially available which is called as denisumab so this dual therapy uh, we are using it and we are making the nanoparticle and uh, these are target uh, passive targeting active targeting which i already told you in case of uh, tumors what happens the blood vessels are broken like this the nanoparticles which are uh, released in the uh, circulation so they will be stealth particles we call them they are coated with pegylated particles so our immune system cannot recognize them they will be keep on in circulation once they pass through these broken blood vessels they reach into the tumor area in the tumor the lymph drainage is also very poor so they they are also negative charged particles so they bind to the membrane very well and then they get endocytosis so this is one is passive targeting the other one is active targeting so uh, we exploit the lymph node and bone vasculature for targeting lymph nodes and bone possesses these uh, big sinusoidal capillaries so blood flow in the lymph node and bone capillaries are slower than in the other capillaries so we can use uh, this thing so this is the nanoparticle we prepared uh, so it's a plj based nanoparticle and uh, don't want to go into details because of the time constraint and uh, we made the nanoparticle and then we injected in the animal because we are going to address the bone we want to make sure that the particles reaches the bone so when we injected the animal and we did an uh, uh, live imaging these animals are live uh, we call it as uh, iv is imaging uh, this infrared dye this is an infrared dye at an infrared uh, wavelength they get exposed so we want to make sure this is in the bone and we want to make sure this is not an artifact so we isolated the thigh bone this you can see here this is the uh, entire spinal cord and then thigh bone was cut a um, longitudinal section has been taken and the cells has been scrapped and shown here the cells has been flushed and then the flow cytometry has also been done we can show that 90 percentage of the bone cells contains the particles this is the result so one we injected two we shown that it is in the bone three we shown make sure that these uh, particles are within the bone and uh, we made sure using the flow cytometry so then we need a model uh, to make a model what we did you know like uh, we took the mice like this and we injected the tumor in the tibia of the mice where this bone uh, metastasis model this is we call it as bone metastasis model and these cancer cells uh, contains the uh, luciferin uh, luciferase enzyme in it so when we inject luciferin from outside they will glow okay so it will be like this so wherever uh, you see this glowing these are nothing but the cancers so one is a contralateral leg uh, one is the tumor leg and another one is a contralateral leg where which is no tumor is there you can see here how strong the signal is under the ivis the same instrument and um, we wanted to see whether the tumor is uh, progressing or metastasizing to somewhere else also because this signal is too strong other signals we are not able to see so we removed the leg amputated the leg and then we saw like you know it is going through the inguinal canal through all the lymph nodes as what is the way uh, normal metastasis to happen the same way it is going to all the through all the lymph nodes so this is the model we established and uh, i will go a little quicker till what time i can talk acha so, actually the meeting is scheduled till 7 o'clock so we can talk okay i will finish in next 10 minutes i will highlight ah. some of the things and i can stop there maybe 5 minutes okay oh, okay sir yeah so this is the model which we established and then uh, what we did you know we tested them uh, we used the taxol as the nanoparticle taxol nanoparticles we prepared and then we tested it and then to our surprise you know uh, there is no uh, much therapy you know like there is no significant difference between the taxol in solution versus taxol in nanoparticle and uh, we were analyzing why everything particle went there went into the bone the taxol is also been there but why it is happened because of the slow release you know the release was very poor most of the drug was bind to the particle itself only 24% of the drug has been released so now we have to readdress this issue so we went into next uh, this work whichever i showed you is a 5 years of work on one phd work 
So next, what we did, you know, we wanted to go to a next higher dose, higher drug that is docetaxel, which is much potent than the taxol. They both look uh, identical. Only difference is at the uh, C10, uh, the tax, uh, docetaxel as an OH group, whereas he has an ester, acetate ester. And he has an benzamide here, and he has again a uh, tertiary butyl carbamate ester here. So this is the only difference, and we thought like we already standardized the technique, we already identified the polymer, we can make the particle easily. When we made the particle uh, using the polymer, which we used for taxol, we got a big surprise that nanoparticle did not form at all. We were investigating at various angles uh, because we know the protocol has been thoroughly worked out in the lab for almost 30 years, so no mistake can happen, but the nanoparticle was not forming. <clears throat> Identical structured drugs, nanoparticle did not form. To our surprise, then we worked out at the basic level. We went to the solid state solubility studies and we found taxol is compatible with certain polymers, docetaxel is compatible with the different polymers. Polymers, whichever taxol is comfortable, docetaxel is not comfortable just because of that OH and this uh, ester group. We made the particles and then uh, we tested them. The release profile was very high. You can see here. We tested them in the cell lines and then we tested them in the animal models. In the animal model, we can see here, we can give four injections and the tumor did not came back till 25 weeks. So 84 days after 13th week, we did not give the drug. 84 days without the uh, tumor has been seen from the last dose of the nanoparticle. When you convert that into the human life, it is six years. So we would like to see when the tumor will come back. So we requested our uh, IR, I mean, uh, IRB, the BRU we call that, BRU to extend the study. After getting a proper permission again, that was a pilot experiment. After getting a permission again, we did a proper study where we gave four injections each month. And then we left at the 13th week. You can see till, uh, you know, 40 weeks, there is no tumor come back. Because of the control animals are dying, we have to fit at the 40 week. So which you convert uh, in this 40 weeks is almost six, uh, I mean six to seven months. The tumor remission, without tumor, the animals were surviving after the last dose of injection for 189 days. If you convert that into human years, it is 14 years. Somebody is with the cancer, you give them the four dose only. After four dose, you maybe once in two years, you give one injection. They can live for 14 years without the tumor, but eventually the tumor came back at the last. But here we are extending the their lifespan. So this is the uh, animals. You know, you can see here um, untreated animal, uh, control animal without any tumor. You can see the bone is intact. Tumor injected, uh, control animal, where you can see no treatment has been given. You can see bone has been chewed by the osteoclastic activity. And here, uh, treated with the denisumab, from outside, the animal looked normal. It looked uh, walking, but under the micro CT, we can see bone damage is there. And this is the animal treated with the docetaxel nanoparticles. These are the animals with the dual therapy. Even at the animals at the 40 weeks, with the, even with the dual therapy, you can see the bones are intact, same as like the control animals. So this is our uh, histochemistry. And uh, with this, uh, we can show that combination treatment of docetaxel nanoparticles with the antibody was synergistically effective, and they were able to treat the tumor. So we had uh, similar experiments with the uh, uh, breast cancer also, where we made the nanoparticles which can cross the uh, plasma membrane of drug resistant cells and they can effectively deliver the drug. These are the, some of the nanogels which we made and then we tested them uh, uh, in vitro. We, we found that they can arrest the cells at the G2M phase and we did the molecular aspects of it also. And uh, these are some of the uh, treated animals and we found that they could uh, stop the metastasis. These are exosomes released by the exosomes are nothing but this is the last one. Exosomes are nothing but lipid molecules which will carry uh, lipid uh, droplet like structures which will carry the RNA or protein or DNA any material which can go to a distant site where it can home the cancer cell. Say for example, if I am talking from here, if I want to come to Delhi, before I am coming there, I have to make a call, arrange some room, lodging, etc. by phone. We use a signal via phone, whereas the cancer cell use exosomes. They will deliver, the ex uh, they will release the exosomes from their body, they go to a distant site, 
they will talk to the cells there own them and they will tell hey our friend is going to come please accept him so when we treated them with the nano medicine we were able to stop this exosomes movement and as well as uh, the uh, metastasis uh, due to time constraint i'm not going in detail in all these things and uh, this is the animal study where we can see nano formulation you know work better than all other uh, all other you know buffer untreated animals and everything and with this <clears throat> i sincerely thank the organizers and uh, my dean uh, professor r vardrajan sir for allowing me to uh, present a talk to delhi college of pharmacy and i sincerely thank uh, the md uh, chairman and the principal of the institution thank you very much Thank you, sir, for your extremely informative talk. Now, students can ask your qu queries by unmuting your microphone one by one. Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, sir. I'm Jinsi Pijon. Uh, yes. Sir, I would like to ask you, like, uh, can nanoparticles enter or uh, damage the DNA? Pardon me, nanoparticle enter. Or, uh, damage the DNA. Oh, it can enter or damage the DNA. See, the uh, DNA size is 2.5 nanometer, and most of the nanoparticles which we use are um, stay mostly in the cytoplasm, and uh, these particles. glycolic acid, which we used in the Krebs cycle, and will be converted into carbon dioxide and water. So it's of uh, it. It will not uh, damage the DNA directly. Whereas there are uh, you know par metal particles like uh, gold and as well as uh, uh, silver or iron, they can uh, resonate to the external light. Thereby they can damage the cellular membranes, and I don't think uh, they will also damage the DNA directly by themselves. But the problem with metal particles, they can produce secondary free radicals. And they can go into the peripherals, and they can uh, stay there because of extreme small size. They cannot be recirculated back. There's a problem with it. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry because of time constraint. I was uh, running fast a little bit. I hope uh, I did my job. Any other question? Good evening, uh, sir. Yeah. Good evening, class. Yeah. Can you please say the difference between active and passive targeting? Yeah. So passive targeting, you know, it, we exploit the body's uh, own system. For example, in case of cancer, the blood vessels are broken down. Broken blood vessels will be there. It needs to form the angiogenesis. The lymph drainage will be very poor. Because of there is a gap, say for example, this finger uh, is like this, there is a gap between these two. If I am sending a molecule, if it goes here, because of that gap, it can go between the gaps, uh, the particle, because virtue of its size, it will uh, go into uh, the area. Because of lymph drainage is poor, they stay there and they bind to the cell membrane. This is passive targeting. In case of active targeting, Say, for example, I want to target the prostate cancer cell. I told there is an antibody called as rank ligand uh, demisumab. This I can use to target them to the osteoclast so that we can uh, stop the osteoclast activity. In this case, I have to conjugate the antibody on surface of the uh, particles. These particles now will go specifically to the osteoclast, which is expressing the receptor for rank ligand, and they will go and bind them like this. Particles has been made uh, for the folic acid receptor like this. Now, in this case, we call them as active targeting. So passive is like a good student who will study by himself. No external effort from the teacher is needed. Needed. Active targeting is like the below pass mark student. The teacher has to put so much efforts to make them pass. Less the difference. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, sir. Sir, can you please uh, explain how can we target bone matrix by nanomedicines? 
Yeah, that's what um, uh, that's the talk I gave right now. Uh, so we can use bisphosphonates to target them. You know, we can um, code them, or we can make. Uh, we, we, there are particles made using albumin also. You know, albumin with bisphosphonates. Or um, depends on the need. What you are going to target? If you are going to target the bone metastasis, I already gave you the answer. Rank ligand antibody denosumab can be used for targeting. And we showed a simple formulation without any conjugation. Passive targeting is more than sufficient. When passive targeting is more than sufficient for the bone, we don't need to waste the resources, right? We should think in terms of a pharmaceutical industry also. Uh, if you are making a formulation for the world, imagine how many liters of antibody you need, and uh, to target them, bring them batch to batch without any variation will be a huge challenge. This is where the PLG particles. And nanomedicines are slowing down, but uh, eventually uh, those things will be worked out. And uh, within a decade, I think that a lot of medicines will be on the market. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Can you explain the last portion of the topic? The last one. Uh, the breast cancer ah. uh, addressing the exosomes. Yeah. <clears throat> breast cancer. Yeah. Uh, so. Most of the cells before metastasis, what they do, you know, they will send a signal to the distant organ. Say, for example, uh, if it's from the breast, it's want to go to the liver or to the bone. Before going to the bone, they will secrete certain substances that is called exosomes. Their membrane will be pinched off. Okay. Like you know, like uh, you make this chapati dough and then you pinch off. No? Like that, it will pinch off. That uh, pinch off membrane will contain the information. Like uh, it will have the RNA or the DNA or the protein, depending upon the cell and the tumor microenvironment. This exosome will be in circulation. It will go to the bones. It will go to the lungs. It will go to everywhere, and then there uh, it will talk to the cells there in the regional cells, local cells. They will make a microenvironment that will be suitable for the cancer cell to come and home there. If not, our immune system can kill them. So once this is ready, the signal will be sent back to the cancer cell. They will tell, boss, we are ready, we can come. Then this the metastasis will start. So what we did, you know, we made the desitabine nanoparticle, uh, which is an epigenetic drug, which could alter the lipid membrane. So when we uh, treated the cells with the lipid, mem uh, lipid membrane altering drug, the lipid uh, the membrane became more fluidic. So this pinching off was not uh, effective. So they bind, they become big, big blobs. When they become big, big uh, balls, they cannot go to the distant region. They bind and then they are eliminated by the complement system of our body. That's what I was trying to tell. That's a different um, uh, talk by itself. Uh, you know, we can talk that in a different in a different uh, scenario. Just wanted to highlight that. Sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, it's me Amrita from Safest Family. Yes. Sir, the bone metastasis can be reversed through this nanomedicine? Um, bone metastasis cannot be reversed. If it is already metastasized, if it is in the advanced stage, what we can do is we can prolong the um, lifespan of the person by decreasing the uh, bone, I mean, bone damage. What we show in the animal model, same can be happen in the human model. If you suspect somebody in stage two or stage three of the cancer, stage three of the cancer, which is already metastasized, then immediately you can go for such therapies. We are currently not available, but eventually it will be available. So that this how research is needed for the human life. May not be in next five years, but next ten years, our kids may have, our grandkids may have. But we are seeding the seeds for those kind of a thing. But Yes, we can stop. That's what I told you. By four injections, we can enhance the life by 14 years. So if somebody is having cancer around 60 or 70 years, he's living 14 more years is more than enough without any pain or anything. You know? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, yeah. could you please explain yeah. that? Is there any side effects of using nanotechnology in mold metastasis? Um, nanotechnology is a broad term, uh, Varanya. Uh, we are, what we are using is a biodegradable particle which is approved by the FDA. 
the sutures which are made uh, for the human surgery, which is also made of the same polymer, which will dissolve by itself, so there is no side effects. Okay, if you are okay. using a metal particles, your yeah, side effects are there. Because they are not absorbable, they are biocompatible. There is a difference between biocompatible and biodegradable. They are compatible but not absorbable. Here it is uh, degradable and absorbable and metabolized by the body itself. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So I thank you, sir, once again for spending your valuable time with us. It was such an informative talk. Thank you so much. So, do you know, like, uh, uh, pharmacists can go in many, many things. There are a lot of uh, time, uh, the legendary pharmacies are there. One such is the inventor of the Coca Cola. Do you know? Coca Cola was invented by the pharmacist. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. So, we pay an uh, accolades to all the pharmacists today, and you are all the pharmacists, and a uh, big hail to all of you for helping the serving the human community, either directly or indirectly. Even in teaching, we are producing a lot of pharmacists, so it's a noble job. I sincerely thank um, all the teachers, and uh, big salute for you all on this pharmacist day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, there is an announcement for the participants. The link for providing e-certificate has been posted in the chat box. Please fill it up accordingly. So, next, I welcome Mr. Subhidya V, Assistant Professor, the Daily College of Pharmacy and Research Center, for delivering the word of time. Good evening to one and all present here. Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Dr. R. Varadarajan, sir. Today's resource person, Dr. Shivakumar Vijayagavlu, sir. Most respected principal, Dr. Shijikumar, sir. Chairman, Dr. Deena Das, madam. CEO, Dr. Shaiju David Alpi, sir. Vice principal, Dr. Sina, ma'am. And all other participants. On behalf of the pharmacology department, the Delhi College of Pharmacy and Research Center, I extend my gratitude to our honorable chief guest, Professor Dr. R. Vardarajan, sir, for inaugurating this special occasion. So we are really enlightened with your presence. A special thanks to today's resource person, Dr. Shivakumar, sir, who shared the importance of nanomedicine and bone metastasis. Thank you so much, sir. I would further extend my hearty thanks to our principal, Dr. Shijikumar, sir, for providing immense support to make this webinar successful. Thank you, sir. I would especially thank our chairman, Dr. Dina Das, madam, for her unflattering support and confidence in us. Thank you, ma'am. I extend my gratitude to Dr. Shaiju David Alfie, sir, CEO, for inspiring and encouraging us. Thank you, sir. I must thank all the participants of today's function who attended the webinar with a great enthusiasm. And I must thank all the department members and student coordinators for their cooperation. Thank you all. Thank you, Ananda. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, let us raise from our seat for the national anthem. Janaganamana Athinayaka Jayahe Bharat Bhagya Vidada Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Marat, Dravid, Ukkala, Banka, Bindi, Himachal, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchchal, Jalati, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jahe, Tava, Shubha, Ashish, Mahe, Gahe, Tava, Jaya, Gada, Janagana Mangala Daika Jayahi Bharat Bhagya Vidata Jayahi 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 Jaya 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 Jayahi I thank once again everyone for spending your valuable time with us. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, sir.